Uh, so welcome everyone and thank you for joining us at the 14th Salem Lit Fest. I'm Lauren Sapero and I'm a member of the committee that helps to put this on every year. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm super pleased to introduce this session of Romance and Tropes in YA. And I'm going to introduce our panel and get out of the way. So here we go. Alicia Dow is a former pastry chef, food critic, culinary teacher, and youth services librarian. When not writing YA, when not writing YA sci-fi featuring determined black girls like herself, you can find her having epic dance parties with her daughter, baking, mentoring, or taking teeny adventures around New York. Uh, you can find Alicia on Instagram at Alicia Dow. Kendall Colbert is an author living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She writes historical fantasy for young adults, including Murder for the Modern Girl, which was a Junior Library Guild Gold Standard selection and received two star reviews. She graduated from Harvard University with an honors degree in history and literature and lives with her husband, two daughters, and much Instagram dog, Abby. Find Kendall and her dog on Instagram at Kendall Hooper. Our moderator is Lucy Keating, the author of three young adult novels, Dreamology, Literally, and Ride With Me. In her work, she enjoys exploring coming-of-age themes and big romantic tropes. Her work has been translated into about 17 languages, she thinks. She is a graduate of Williams College and the Cuddy Punk Island Writers Residency. I practiced that one. <laughs> Uh, when she's not writing, she enjoys baking, weekend adventures, and obsessing over the latest TV shows. Find her on Instagram at Lucy.keating. Do Turn this on. Can you guys hear us okay? I have a low voice. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a really fun panel. I think uh, all of our books are quite different and, you know, having panels that are more about a specific genre is really great too but one thing i noticed when i was reading both of your books was just how incredibly high concept they both were and that got me really excited um and this is the most i'll talk about myself on the panel <laughs> um, but i have a background in development basically that was where i got my start in publishing i worked for alloy entertainment um, and basically that's a place that comes up with these high, high concept ideas and then turns them into books and movies and so we did like gossip girl vampire diaries sisterhood of the traveling pants everything everything uh so many there's so many um and so that was a place where i worked and it was like right off the bat you went into meetings and they said what do you have for us today like let's pitch and and i would say something like teens at camp and they'd be like get out of here <laughs> that's terrible and i'd be like why not you know gossip girl is just a bunch of like rich kids in new york who you know how high concept is that and they would say no actually gossip girl is about um uh, an anonymous blogger that's like writing about these teens and disrupting their lives um and so i yeah that that's my so when i was reading your books i was like oh great like we can really dig into these amazing stories that are just like so layered and have so many hooks um, and huge stakes. So I thought that would be kind of like a good way to start off. You could just kind of, you, you could speak about, your, tell us about your book and then um, I don't usually do the like, how did you come up with it? But because <laughs> these are such interesting concepts, I thought we would do a little of that to start off. Uh, yeah, so my book is called A Starlet Secret to a Sensational Afterlife. And it is a historical fantasy set in 1930s Hollywood about a girl who's trying to become an actress, but she starts to see the ghosts of dead actresses. And about a boy who uh, is trying to make it as a stuntman, which is very fortunate because he is uh, not able to be hurt or damaged in any kind of way. So um, I kind of fell into this book a bit by accident. It's a companion novel to my last book, just called Murder for the Modern Girl, which is also a historical fantasy about a 1920s flapper. And uh, in that book, I just had this throwaway character that was the main character's little sister. And I just loved that world, that book so much that when my publisher asked me if I had any other ideas, I thought, well, you know, 
when this 12 year old girl turns 18, it'll be 1934, and I love old movies, I love Hollywood, and I thought, I'll write a book about this girl trying to be in Hollywood, like how fun that will be. Not really thinking that if you look into the history of Hollywood, it's like, like you scratch the surface and so much abuse and exploitation comes out that it is horrifying <laughs> to uh, research. Um, so that was kind of, you know, I wanted to write about Hollywood. While I was researching a lot of this, Me Too was coming out and I was thinking a lot about what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be somebody who's historically marginalized? What does it mean to be a creative person who just wants to be creative? And you have these people in positions of power that are trying to bring you down. And so my, my challenge as a writer was, how do I approach this really dark and depressing topic? And because I'm writing for teenagers, I want there to be some element of hope. You know, I don't want it to be so dark and depressing. And I was writing this book in the middle of the pandemic, which, you know, the historically wonderfully cheerful time that we all went through really, really well. And I started to think about, you know, when you're fighting these battles of, of oppression and you're trying to reach some position of equality and justice and fairness and, you know, retribution, there's no finish line. There's no point where you're like, we did it, okay. solve the problem, everything is great. And the real challenge is how do you find moments of joy and success and levity and strength to kind of keep yourself going. So once I kind of had that in mind, that became kind of like the through line for this book and it became much more a book about resilience and community and finding an inner core of joy and protecting that inner core of joy and romance, the book has romance in it too, and finding allies and figuring out where can you put your strength. And uh, it just sort of happened that I love writing in all these different genres and so <laughs> that's how sort of like a, a, yeah, a idea that kind of started out very simply, which was, I just want to write about Hollywood, turned into this like, you know, five mixing genres. Yeah, supernatural, <laughs> kind of. mystery. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So hello everyone, I am Alicia Dow, and I wrote The Sound of Stars, The Kindred, A Song of Salvation. I have middle grade coming out next month. Um, I write science fiction fantasy. And how did I come up with them? I don't know. <laughs> I, had a, I had this idea in my head that it would be really cool to see a girl who had a locker in a school and she was keeping contraband books in them and was handing them out. And like all stories go, I had to like come up with something for why this happened. And I thought, let's make it because of an alien invasion. That's totally normal. And then we'll just see how it goes from there. And thankfully, um, I went with Harper Collins, and we saw how that went, and they were into it, which was very surprising to me. Um, and it, you know, tackled really heavy themes, but I just really wanted to have fun, which is basically how I write any book: is how fun can I, ha how much fun can I have when I'm writing this, and how much fun do I want the readers to have when they're reading it. Um, and that's really how it went with it. <laughs> and then with the Kindred, it's all in the same universe. And I just really had a blast. And again, heavy themes, but lots of fun. And it's you know science fiction fantasy, so you have to really think about the structure of the world you're living in, while also creating an entire universe without the same structure. It has to be totally different. It has to have so many different creatures, so many different thoughts, and then I don't know if I would say it was high concept. I would say it because I'm like, it's cool. But you got like <laughs> podcasters. I, I and you've got like. I, I got. I have like when you're in sci-fi, you have a lot of things that can inspire you. I mean, some of the the biggest genre media-wise is sci-fi, and I don't think people realize that quite often. But if you watch Star Wars, and there's a lot of Star Wars entities, if you watch. Um, Apple TV has like a million of them and they're all really really good 
you kind of go, well, how do I fit into that? And then you just have fun. And so I get to live within these create universes and have my characters live within them. And it's just really, really an honor and a privilege to be able to write them. And it's an honor and privilege to write them for teens. So everything I've done, very fun based. <laughs> and I, I have to enjoy it. Otherwise, it would be like, why do it? And it shows on the page. It's, it was very fun to, to read <laughs> both of your books. Uh, I really enjoyed. Um, so, digging in a little bit there, um, let's talk about stakes. Uh, maybe of your characters, sort of like what the obstacles your characters are up against, because that's obviously one of the bigger things that keeps the pages turning in these books. Um, and I, uh, there's just like a lot of big external stakes that your, your characters are going are, are dealing with and I wonder if you could talk about um, how that shaped them and how it impacts their relationships on the page because I think that's a, a huge thing in books like this and all kinds in the relationships we see in, in romance and teen romances like um, how characters sort of push against boundaries both like with themselves and then like against each other. Um, yeah, so I think specifically the romance, it's one of my favorite things to write. I think writing teen romance is, it's just so, you know, your first love, your first sort of like big romance is such a magical thing for most people, not for everybody, not to like, you know, just to generalize. Um, but I think sort of what makes it so good for um, teens specifically is like, when I think about why, I, I always think it's about identity. It's kind of this moment where sort of everything that you were told about yourself as a childhood butts up to everything you become as an adult. You have this moment where you really can choose the person that you think you want to become. And you have sort of all this agency for the first time. It's really exciting. It's really dynamic for a writer. And with relationships, I think personally what I like writing why I think they're so fun is that, you know, a lot of times you meet this person and they're able to see these things in you that you may not have even seen in yourself and being able to see yourself through that other person's eyes changes the way that you view yourself, hopefully in a positive way. And for these two characters, the, the sort of fun thing about this was that uh, you know she is a young starlet and he is this stuntman they're working for uh, basically this movie studio that's supposed to be MGM but it's you know a fake MGM in my in my book world um, and they're put into this sham relationship which of course is like a thing that in the 1930s they were like this is a healthy thing to do to people we'll pretend that they're married or like dating. It's not going to mess up anybody at all. Um, but and that, sorry to interrupt you, but that is so like that's such a romance, a great romance trope. Yes, fake, fake exactly. Relationships are one of the most popular romance tropes. Yeah, yes, so. yeah, and you know it's fun to write. Like they are so combative in this way that really kind of shaped both their characters. Like they were not happy to be in this relationship. They were not happy with. Uh, sort of how it made the other person behave. The stuntman is very, Declan is very suspicious of kind of fakeness. And he sees like this girl as like, you know, changing who she is as not being authentic. And then she sees him as basically like, I, I can't swear on this, right? <laughs> anyway, see, she sees him as like kind of like a, like a butthole a little bit. You know, he's like <laughs> kind of like, you know, not like, She's like, just relax, have fun. Like, you're in this great city, you're doing all these fun things. And he's like, no, this city is terrible. I hate Los Angeles. So it's it was fun to write like that sort of combative relationship where they're sort of bickering with each other, and then to the challenge of moving them to a point where they they come to respect each other and and really show each other the parts that they're not showing other people, and especially for uh, for Declan, I use fantasy in my books as as a metaphor. So unsurprisingly, the the uh, impenetrable stuntman is like not open to love or thinks that he's like 
you know, love is something that he sees as just something that will hurt him. And so for him to sort of recognize, um, you know, that that softness and vulnerability is really where strength lies. It's not in being, uh, you know, kind of like this, this stoic man, like, it takes real strength and real masculinity to be vulnerable with somebody. That's kind of like the journey that he has to be on. And I just love how romance allows you to kind of get deeper into those parts of a character that if I was writing this as just, you know, this one girl's journey to become a, an actress, those are kind of parts that she, she might not really get to explore. And certainly like my book is dual narrator, it wouldn't, even really have like the the boy's perspective of all. So yeah, I just love like how how romance allows like allows you to view another part of of your characters. Plus, it's really fun. <laughs> and I will say one thing I really liked um, in your writing was that I I did feel like when I was re reading Henrietta through Declan's eyes, I did see her differently than when I'm in, and that doesn't always happen. I, I feel um, so. I I would be like whoa, like like she'd say something to him, and I'd be like, hang on, I didn't like I didn't get that. When we're in her head, we don't necessarily see that. So she's got this. I don't know. She had this whole flirtatious side. <laughs> anyway, um, so <clears throat> I'm sorry. I would say that when you are writing love, you have to start thinking about how it's accessible and how it's relatable. And then you have to think about why these two people would love each other. And whether it's romantic or it's friendship or it's any of these things, you have to know these people enough for them to get there. Um, and because it's so relatable love, you are thinking about how embarrassing it is and how it makes you vulnerable and it makes you say some things that will cause miscommunication. And it's just all of this stuff. And when you're writing with teens and love, then you're thinking it's even bigger emotions. And so if you're going to go at it that way, that's how I approached it. I am going to be a lot more in your head and very, I think, a bit cerebral with it. And I can add on the tropes of like um, enemies to lovers. I think I did with the first book. The second one was friendship to lovers. And the third one was not really. <laughs> I wouldn't say there was that one thing. I guess it would be if there was a trope, never meet your idols. But then maybe you might fall in love with them, so that's cool. Um, that's where I went with it. I just had a lot of fun exploring how these people would get where they were going in the most emotional way, and that they would eventually open themselves up to it. And in the process, you're going to learn them as characters. And of course, I'm learning them as I write them. Um, but hopefully, the reader feels some kind of kinship with that. And they can relate to that. And when they are reading it, they're like, oh, I would feel the same way. And that's what I'm going for every time. So if I happen to have a romance trope in there, um, and I have quite a few, I'd say, and all of them, um, it's really just about exploring all those emotions in different ways and then like going, ooh, this setup is gonna, let's see what's gonna happen with this setup and we're gonna have a lot of fun. And then that's where it gets you. I think romance tropes on their own are very, very cool and they give structure, but they also are that, can be the selling point for some people. Some people really want this enemy to lover, so now you're gonna have to actually make them enemies. And that means you're gonna have to explore how you make them unenemies. Um, so it, they work, but then I think you really also have to do a lot of character work at the same time, where you just have to know why these people are going to end up there. And maybe you're going to appreciate them too. And that's, it's a, it's a long process, but it's one we end up, I think most writers really end up loving, right? Yeah, and I think I was just talking to a friend about this because I sent her some early pages of something that I'm working on. and. All, every one of her notes sort of like came back to this idea that the main character didn't really like she was just not quite a whole person yet and and as a result we don't really know why she's so attached to the person she's in love with at the beginning of the book we don't know why um, it hurts her when he doesn't want to be with it like we don't and and I realized I was like oh my gosh if I at first it seemed like 10 notes in this email and then I realized if I could just 
do a little more work <laughs> on this and, and be a little less lazy about this character. Um, I'm actually going to answer six out of ten of these notes just because like I'm solving what her sort of like hang up is in this case and how that is affecting the relationships around her is going to like do so much um, for the romance. So um, yeah, I did, I did notice in both of your books I felt like there was this meeting when the uh, when Declan meets I'm gonna mix everyone. Declan <laughs> sees Henrietta for the first time. We're just talking about her, and then when Wesley meets Zari, oh wait, right. But I was thinking the friendship there, yeah, 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 between like he, they each have these sort of notions about that this person they're meeting right away, and they like have these, pre and then and then you see the moment from each of them where they're like. I watched her be like really brave and like a really good friend, and I watched I watched her do something in a moment that was really hard, um, and I see her now in this like new light that like makes me um, yeah it was it was an interesting actually piece of books I've read. So okay, so the, I have those are like sort of the more bro the broader questions I had for both of you. Um, uh, so you kind of, I, I'm going to get into some more specific stuff. Um, Kendall, you kind of talked about this already, but, well, actually, in, in both of your books, you do have this sort of, um, there's like this, there's a lot of female, like, there's some rage brewing beneath the surface, I found. <laughs> and I wonder if um, you can sort of talk, you talked a little bit about it, but if there's, in terms of like, Hollywood is just filled with essentially like missing and dying girls in this book, and it's like you don't shy away from it. Like you're like, and and you show it in this really incredible way with these ghosts that are coming back and speaking to this character. Um, and I I told you at one point we learned one of the missing girls was in um, like these were these shorts basically yeah, like serialized, serialized yeah. shorts, and you learn that like a cliffhanger. Every at the end of each one of these shorts, this girl was about to die, basically, and then dangling from the cliff, like lit dangling from the cliff, and that the audience would be coming back to like see if the girl made it, and it was like this amazing to me metaphor for like how women were treated um, the whole way through this book and at this time period. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you want to have any like. Oh yeah, I have a lot to say about this. Um, so yeah, the book is all about these missing actresses, and it was very important to me that the stories of these women were all based in reality. There is nothing that I put in the book, with the exception of like a few very specific plot details, there's nothing that I made up. Everything is based on real accounts, usually accounts that are told in the future, they're based on newspaper accounts. And uh, the sort of the germ of the idea of this of this book or the that plot of the missing girls came from this series of articles that a Chicago Tribune writer wrote in the 1930s, where she traveled to Hollywood and she talked to a law enforcement officer in California who remained anonymous. And uh, people have there's sort of questions of how exactly credible maybe some of this is or who this person was, but she was a respected journalist of, of the time. And she spoke to this man who said that all day he gets phone calls from family members asking where their daughter is. And it was such a common thing for young women to come to Hollywood, to run out of money very quickly, to be taken in by different scams, to be used or exploited in various different ways. Usually, often they got, you know, basically sex trafficked, what we would think of as, as nowadays. And the shame of that would be so strong that they would never return home. And some of them would sort of remain in this world. Some of them were ne never able to get out of this world. Many of them remained anonymous. But it was such a prevalent problem in Los Angeles that the city was really not willing to to face. And there's so many incredible stories that I wish I could have put in the book. One of the things that the that the the uh, Los Angeles uh, Chamber of Commerce 
was so excited by this article and they put out like a rebuttal of like, here are all the things that we do for young women when they come to Hollywood. And one of the things that they said was that when a woman, when a young woman doesn't have any money to come home, they would wait until somebody died in a adjacent town or city and this girl would accompany the coffin on the train back home. That was like the way that they would get these, these girls back to their families. So there are just so many stories of these, of these women and so many stories that we will never know the full extent of, so many women who came out and told their stories. There's a, there's a woman or there's a character in, this, in the book who dies from essentially a, a botched abortion that on her death certificate, it was listed as uh, complications from appendicitis. And that came out of Rita Moreno's memoir, where she talked about how she got pregnant, she was forced to have an abortion, that almost killed her, and nobody knew that this is what it was. And she had said, if I had died, it would never have gone down in history as, as you know, complications from an abortion. And it was very important to me when I was dealing with history to respect those stories and to put them out there and to make it very clear that these were real things that happened to, you know, largely women. And so even this, this you know, the cliffhanger term, which is such sort of like a great historical trivia, you know, it's a real thing. Like in the 1910s, these women would go out, they would be paid basically nothing and, you know, literally be dangling <laughs> from cliffs so that the audiences would come back and see what would happen to them. And, you know, it was something that, that I took really seriously and was very, uh, you know, cognizant of that I didn't want to glamorize it and I didn't want to exaggerate it because the truth itself was so, was so incredible and the reality was <clears throat> a lot of the reason why we don't know these stories is because the women that did try to come out were faced with the most horrendous PR campaigns you could possibly imagine. Their characters were maligned, their careers were destroyed, and they were kind of never heard from ever again. So I, I really wanted to write a book that, that put those stories out there that hopefully will encourage people to look into the truth of what happened to a lot of these women and kind of how, how brave they were, a lot of them for, for risking so much of their career and their their life and their passion. You know, these women were artists. They wanted, they just wanted to create. So when you talk about sort of female rage, <laughs> uh, yeah, I felt a lot of rage kind of, you know, like, like the, the big challenge of this book is, uh, or my first book, not to like spoil it, but it's also about female rage. Um, I guess that's my specialty. specialty. Um, <laughs> And in that book, what was so satisfying is that I was able to write a happy ending. So I will happily spoil my first book, Murder for the Modern Girl. It ends in the happiest way you could possibly imagine. I just wanted the ending to feel so joyful. And then when I approached this book, it's like, well, okay, nothing got better in 1934. Like, we're still dealing with a lot of this garbage today. Like, there's, there's still, this still is, is existing. And so, that really sort of got my anger fired up. And I even have the character say at one point, you know, and, and still like with the strike going on right now, it's, it's the exact same thing. Why aren't the people in charge listening to artists? Why aren't the people in charge just letting artists create? Like there's so many examples of when you just let creative people go and support them. You have great art, art that people want to, people want to see. You have Barbie, the movie. Like, you know, why aren't we moving in this direction? And there are just too many uh, men in charge that are, are not um, kind of catching on. So this book was, was sort of like a, an argument in favor of the opposite. Cool. Yeah, I was like, I, I kept reading pieces and being like, is that real? Is that true? Is that true? Is that true? And it sounds like um, Alicia, so I wrote this to you. I, I felt like your main character, Zara, it seems like is caught between, she's this god reborn and, and she is like, is told that she possibly could like 
save the universe or and cr like create life, but she's also seems very angry and about what has happened to her planet, her people, her world, and how they were essentially sort of forgotten. Um, and I found that oscillation back and forth like really powerful. Uh, and I wonder if you wanted to just, yeah, talk about that in her character. <laughs> So I started off my universe with The Sound of Stars, which happens in, on Earth. And because I started there and all these books are connected, it meant that the scope was small at the beginning and grew very large by the end. And that meant I was going to have to carry with it threads of humanness and, and uh, humanity and Earth. And then it meant that I could explore old hate in a new universe. Um, and so because of that, I was thinking about these main characters. In all three books, the main character is a black teenage girl. And if you're thinking about black teenage girls, and you're not thinking rage, I don't know, I think you might need to <laughs> reconsider, because this is, that was the center of each story. And the first book, it's rage, but slight rebellion. The second book, it's resigned rage. And in the third book, it is rage rage. And she is so angry and she's like, why would I want to save everyone when I'm forgotten, I'm overlooked, and yet everyone expects me to do the right thing time and time again without having to give anything back. And that is extremely parallel to the world that we are living in now. And I wanted to explore that and I wanted to Hopefully, if, if, I, if there are black teens reading this, they are going to really relate because you are expected to do a lot of things, but you cannot do just one thing wrong or your life could be gone. Um, and that's a powerful thing in itself, which meant that if I'm exploring these themes and emotions and I want my readers to relate to it, then I have to be completely honest and I have to be as enraged as I want to be. And so Zara is, all of these things, she is aware that she can make things a lot better, but she doesn't see why she should. And over the course of the book, she has to see it through people and experiences. And that is why it's so important in that book to have good friendships, to feel like she has found a family, to feel like she has found her place. Um, and then going, well, there are things worth saving. And even the things that I don't like, we can change, and that's very hopeful. And maybe a little altruistic if you think about the world we're in now, but I love to have hope also in each story because otherwise it would feel, again, where you're writing something that is all of these things. But if you're leaving people with a sadness, especially in YA books, then you don't want teens to feel that after either. You want them to feel like they have power, like they could change things, like they could do all of these great big things. And for black teens especially, that you can be the love interest, that you can have adventures in space, you can create a universe, you can do all of these gigantic, cool sci-fi things. And even if there is old hate that carries through it, you can find a way to kind of not just push through, but change it. I just was thinking about your love interest, and there's this wonderful podcaster, Ruben, and I just love the moment when he's like, Wesley is my, or he's like, my boyfriend, and Wesley's like, I'm your boyfriend? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. Like, he's such a wonder, Ruben gives, brings this just like, wonderful humor to the, to the, I mean, there's a lot of, there is, it was genuinely fun reading your book, so there's But it, there has to be, it has to be levity. Yeah. Because otherwise, that third book, A Song of Salvation, is the hardest hitting book out of all of them. And if you are reading that and you're taking everything from that without Reuben as a character, you're thinking, this is very bleak. <laughs> Holy crap. I don't know what's going to happen. Is she going to do the entire universe? Like, I don't know. But then you have Reuben there who is just kind of like sunshine and lollipops and it's all going to be okay and to have him in the mix of two very pessimistic very hopeless people 
is it adds the levity, but it also is that connection you need in order for the story to not just work, but to feel hopeful and good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and real too, because in real life, like people make jokes, especially when they're in sort of dark situations. I think like that's a a like a beautiful, not like a coping method, but like a beautiful way to kind of find the strength to continue through something. I think you need it. I think you have to have those moments where. If you're, you know, if any story, but in love stories too, where you have to just have those completely ridiculous, funny moments because they're relatable. And, you know, as I said earlier, I think Kendall, you know, like, love in itself is very embarrassing. And that's going to lead to a lot of humor. And I feel like if you miss the humor of it, it'll be just very vulnerable and maybe even a little cringy. <laughs> um, so you have to have the humor in there. Yeah, he's always, and it, it makes it feel contemporary too. He's always like, he's always like podcasting when he's not supposed to in the <laughs> beginning. Like he, he's doing it, and and you're like along for his ride, and then they're getting into like more and more dangerous situations, and he's like, okay, so, you're in. <laughs> and then he's getting in trouble with everyone who's around him. Um, and it's, it's a great device. Like it's just yeah. Um, okay, so I think we should. We have 15 minutes left. I think we should maybe take some. Yeah, we can open it up to questions if anyone. Wants Question, feel free to raise your hand, but you all can also feel free to keep having your conversation and see a hand pop up. Just okay. No one has anything, I just don't have anything. So, can I jump in? Yeah. So, I love what Alicia said about friendships because I think, in even in, in romance books, you know, I don't know what it was, what everybody's teen experience was like, but. My friendships were the most important relationships that I had, even my like, you know, dopey teenage boyfriends, sorry guys out there. But uh, I think like friendships in YA, I feel like sometimes don't get the attention that they deserve, but they're such vital parts of a character. And especially when a story, when a character is going through something that's so difficult, having really strong friends around them is something that I think just can be like this jet fuel for this character and and for my character Henrietta she has this this group of ghost girls who appears to her and they each kind of bring something special and you know a lot of times they bring sort of like moments of, of levity where you know they're dead so there's the stakes for them are very low and they're always like kiss him to her and she's like I can't I can't like so it's fun to kind of like have those things but it but the reality is like that's that's the way life is. Like, you know, your your friends are your buds. They're the ones who are there to kind of like validate all your decisions, whether they're good or whether they're bad, and they're there to kind of like help you and pick you up. And I I I love that like you pointed out those friendships and I think like just I don't know, I just love a good YA friendship, you know? I also have to say, I think this is a very different topic, and I could go on it for a long time, <laughs> but I won't, um, but I could. So I think that with YA, a lot of friendship books, there aren't that many. Yeah. Because for some reason, and I know the reason, but I don't think you need to, um, <laughs> people have decided that the people who love YA the most are adults, and adults want the romance and they don't really understand why there should be space for friendship. Um, because it's just like, what is that to the book? Unless it's like helping you with the romance. And you're like, no, when you are YA, friends are very important. But for some reason, there is this thing going on where if you are writing about family and friendship, and those are the two most important things, that is now middle grade. And if you are <laughs> writing romance, that's more YA. And I don't know where these lines have come from or why that's a thing. And again, I really could talk to you about this for like <laughs> an hour. Um, but that's really, really strange. And I think it does a disservice to teens when you don't have those things in there. Because for a lot of teens, friends and family is like the whole, like 90% yeah. of their life. So I cannot imagine why this is happening the way it is. I mean, <laughs> for the purpose of this conversation. I cannot. Um, but I think when you get to do it, it's it's such a beautiful thing. And 
it's so important because it gives support to your characters and it gives them a space for them to be themselves mm -hmm. and that also in the end helps readers relate and make something a bit more accessible and then that's how you find your audience so it's very strange but i love friendship books too yeah and even as an author i feel like one of the ways to get to know a character is to give them a buddy like I, I always find that my boy characters tend to be harder for me to kind of crack. And on my, my, my first draft, Declan has, has a best friend. And my first draft, his friend was, a, was his manager. He was sort of like this remote character who kind of like stepped in to be like, you have to be in the pictures. And he was like, no, and that was it. And then my editor was like, I, I, I just don't feel like I know Declan. Like, what, who is he? What does he do? And so I had this idea to age down the manager and make him his best friend and they grew up together and he became like this person that, you know, Declan who does not like to be vulnerable could be vulnerable with. And at the same time, he's, you know, like this, like, boy character, like boy friendships I always think are so, are so fun. Like I always make this joke with my husband where he goes to see his, his best friends and he comes home and I'm like, what are the kids doing? Like, did they move into their new kitchen? Like, what's going on with their, did they get the new car? Like, how's the kid doing in kindergarten? And my husband's like, we didn't talk about any of that. We just like came up with what was the best baseball team with character, with players whose first names start with the letter P. I was like, you are useless to me. But like, that's, that is like, you know, kind of the way that, that a lot of like those male friendships are is like, they have this kind of like, deeper connection that it's not like a, a, a typical girl friendship where they're like really like getting in deep it's like no like he's my I know that I will die for him and I don't know his last name like <laughs> but it's such a it's such like a nice way as an author like for me as soon as I added in this other character I was like oh I know who this who this guy is like I know what he would say to his best friend I know like how they spend their time together I know like what he wants out of his life. It's just like a, it's a great sort of writing tool and, and hopefully as for a reader, it's like a fun way to kind of see another side of this character. I just, I was thinking about too, I saw, I watched Sitting in Bars with Kate last night. I don't know if anyone's seen that yet, but that's about female friendship. They're like just out of college, but I like bawled my eyes out over that. And it was really <laughs> just, it was really friendship. It was really, it's sort of pitched as a rom-com, Really wasn't like the the romance was really secondary in it, and and then also I saw I I, I watched Shelter Harlan Coben's book, uh, or I, I don't know if it was ever a book first. I don't know how those properties are getting moved. It was a book first, um, but they have some really nice uh, teen boy friendship in that, and I was I I, I was moved by. I was like there were like some real moments of vulnerability on screen, and I was like. And I'd like to see more of that. Um, but of course, to do it, they like the boy characters, like quirky and like not afraid to, you know. It's like, <laughs> okay. Not like the boys. <laughs> um, no. Anybody have a question? Um, oh, question oh, in blue. Uh, what was the process of the communication? Um, so I have had my agent for 10 years at this point, which in publishing is like a century. So all my information may be wildly out of date, but um, basically my, my first book that was published was my third manuscript that I wrote. Um, so I wrote a manuscript queried a bunch of agents. A query is, is uh, basically an email that says your name, your book, which book is about, usually the first 50 uh, words, pages. I don't know. It's been a long time. Um, it's still very 50 pages. No, not 50 words. That will not be <laughs> <laughs> Don't follow any of my advice. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I did, a, I did a round with the first manuscript, which was terrible. Um, then I wrote a second manuscript, which was marginally better, um, but it was a dystopian, which was the hot 
new thing at the time. Um, shows you how old I am and I'm done already. And then my third manuscript was the was the one that I that I got my agent back. So um, yeah, I don't know if anybody is is trying to get an agent. My my biggest advice for getting an agent is make sure that you are extremely happy with your agent because uh, no agent is better than a bad agent. A bad agent is terrible and will stall your career and make you hate publishing, which if you're in publishing for long enough, you might feel those ways anyway. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is, my, that is my short story. I will be very quick. I've had a long road to agents. Like I've been, I've had now. I'm on my fifth agent. And I'm very, 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 very happy. Um, that's probably maybe too honest. I don't know. <laughs> um, every time it's like you know, just finding that person who connects with your work and connects with you as a person. And so really, you have to kind of. I wish this wasn't so, but sometimes finding, like, looking at what agents put out, and then looking at your own work. And then going, oh, this might be a good fit for something because it's like this, and I don't know, like, that could be nice. Also, just really, first, have your support group, number one. Number two, have a group of people you trust to look at your work and be honest with you so that you can get it in the best possible shape you can. And I will never suggest hiring an editor. I know, I'm sorry if there are any editors in the room, sorry. Um, but I don't suggest it. Be happy with what you wrote. Um, and make sure you have friends who are going to look at your stuff. And then, when you're ready to start querying, get your letter as good as you can. Look at who you think is going to make a great match. Query. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, move on. It's not personal. Even if you think the, the rejection is personal, and it will always feel like that every time. I am now years into this, and I'm like, I think book seven contracted. And every time I get a rejection, I'm like, why don't you like me? <laughs> why? Um, don't think that. Don't even like consider it. It is business, and it's never personal. Once you understand that, just lean into what makes you happiest when you write. And that is how you keep yourself like as strong as you can. And it, it's how you enjoy your craft as well. It's like, I, if I didn't enjoy what I wrote, then I'm not going to expect somebody else to. And if that's an agent, then, then we have a problem. So be happy with what you write. Be happy while you're writing. And then I think those other things start to fall into place as you give it a try and you venture out more. But just feel supported. That sort of reminds me about how I feel about how, like, relationship advice I give too. I'm kind of like, <laughs> don't change yourself to be with someone because if they don't like that person, then you weren't even yourself the whole time. Like, you think that you, you, and so with your writing, like, make sure your writing is something you really believe in. Don't change it because someone else told you to. Because then if that gets rejected, then you never, you know, they never even saw the real. With my first book, I sent something in to an, an editor friend who was like, this is okay, but it kind of reads like a real stock teen thing. You're a pretty weird person. You love emotions. Why don't you take another crack of, at it? And I was like, okay, like, you asked for it. And that was the one that someone ended up buying was the one that was just like a little insane. So that, you know, that was, and then behind me for getting reviews, people being like, this main character's like kind <laughs> Main character is me, but okay. <laughs> I love that. So basically, voice, all right? I think that's kind of what you all are sort of saying. Yeah. Sort of information that if you're a person off the brain, voice is so important and you should not change that. You should always just keep pushing forward. Uh, any other last questions before I wrap this up for this one? Uh, we can do boxes in the back over here, so please feel free to pop by the tables. All of these wonderful authors have books over there. They're happy to sign. Um, and I want to thank you all so much for being a wonderful panel, for covering a range of topics outside romance. I agree, um, friendship is so important in YA. It's something that we should be represented much, much more. Um, we have so many wonderful sponsors. I am going to read the full list of them for our next panel, so stay here if you want to hear that full list. It's very <laughs>
<laughs> um, and I want to thank our wonderful audience for being here today and for joining thank us. Thank you. Yes. Um, please stay in your seats because we have Thrills and Chills in YA next with another panel of lovely authors. Um, so stay tuned, like five minutes.